Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Cafferkey, and I'm continuing this series, Master Databricks and Apache Spark. This is lesson 10, creating the SQL tables on Apache Spark. The last video, lesson nine, I talked about creating the SQL tables on Databricks. I'm hoping I don't confuse anyone. I am doing sort of a flipping back and forth. I want to show you how to do things on Databricks, which is a user interface that wraps itself around Apache Spark. But then I also want to show you how to do the same thing on just open source Apache Spark, because that way you'll know how to, the difference is. And there are not many, but there's enough. And there's entire sets of documentation just for Databricks. And not everything will map directly to Apache Spark in every case. So it's good to know the differences. And I'm going to talk a lot about that in this particular things. What are the differences and things to watch out for? So let's jump in. In this particular video, we'll be talking about the AdventureWorks use case, understanding the data, Apache Spark, and creating SQL tables on top of Apache Spark. So the AdventureWorks use case, and I went over this in the last video again, but if you're just following the Spark side, you may not have seen that. The management wants to get business insights from their data, and I'm using the data from something that Microsoft has called the AdventureWorks data set because it's an entire database. I'll be using the data out of their data warehouse version, 2017 uh, data, and I'm extracted as CSV files to make it easier for this. So management wants to get business insights from their data, understanding sales and customer behavior. So they're trying to get a handle as many companies are now, how to leverage data to really get more value and get more sales. So they want to understand these things. The end goal ultimately is they'd like to be able to create a machine learning model that can predict what a given prospect is likely to purchase. Particularly, they mostly they sell bikes. So they want to know what model bike is someone likely to purchase. Looking at the data science process, we can see that we have an analysis stage, right? Analysis, data engineering, and machine learning. We don't have to have all of these for all work. If you've used something like Power BI or Tableau, very often you're going to kind of stop at the exploratory data analysis stage, visuals, give insight, etc. But we started with, at the very top, the analysis stage, identify the use case. Well, I've given you that, and that's typically when management decides what they want to do, and then you have to ask a lot of questions to get your kind of your scope and where the data is, etc. So that's the identified data required. And the next step you're going to go is into is collecting the data, pull it in from wherever it is, ingest it, start to play with it, figure out where the data needs more, uh, has problems, like if there's nulls or missing values, etc. And that's the data preparation stage. And then you get into the exploratory data analysis as shown here. And that's where you do visuals and you're trying to get a handle on the data itself. How many sales do we have? Where are our customers located? What products do we have and what do we sell? So you may not be completely familiar with all of the business aspects and this is a stage where you can get a better feel for the data. And this, again, that may be the end in many places, many companies, that could be it because typically visualizations and dashboards are providing that kind of information. Now, we're gonna be going a step further, so we wanna build predictive models. To build a predictive model, we need features. What are features? Well, there's input data that helps to drive the output. For instance, if you think about what's likely to affect what a customer would buy, well, it might be, to some degree, their age, where they live, uh, whether they have children or not. Sometimes even educational level may affect it uh, because educational level may tie back or to income or things like that, where they may favor certain types of bikes over others. So you can look at all these different things and try to get a sense of what a customer buys. Using historical data, you feed that into a model, and then it will build a predictive model off of that. And so what data you give it, the columns are called features, but you typically have to format them in different ways so that the, the model training will work correctly. And then finally, you train your models and you get the model you want to use, and then they, you deploy that somewhere where it can be used by your service somewhere. So that's sort of the overall steps of the data science process. This is kind of an overview. We're using a dimensionally modeled set of data, roughly dimensional, of the AdventureWorks. Now this shows facts we sell of sales, but it's really going to be uh, fact internet sales. But the same idea, you've got the core numeric data, that's your facts, the metrics, and then the descriptive things, what, when, where, how, that's your dimensions, and they have just one layer out, one key that brings you to the dimensions. 
that's a dimensional model. And redundancy is okay in dimensional modeling. And it might be, if you're used to relational modeling, you don't want redundancy, but you can have it here. Now let's get into a little bit of an issue. When you build, when you use Databricks to build your clusters, you can have any number of clusters. In fact, you can see Databricks as providing the Databricks workspace is kind of an umbrella that can manage many different clusters. You can start and stop and do all these great things. But that's not how Spark is actually designed under the covers. Spark is one cluster at a time. So when you create a Spark cluster in HD Insight on Azure, you're going to be just creating a single Spark cluster. And here's the rub. There's no way to pause a Spark cluster on HD Insight. Databricks allows you to scale and pause, and the pausing part is pretty key. In fact, as you've seen in my videos, you can say after 30 minutes or some amount of time of no use, just terminate the cluster. I call that pausing. It's really terminating the cluster. The cluster goes away, and you don't pay for any compute anymore for the cluster. But with HD Insight, you cannot pause the cluster. You can delete it, or you can keep it. And you can scale it down to as small as you know size clusters you want, but you're still going to be paying for it. So we have a little bit of a problem. Now, when you delete the cluster, you're deleting everything because that's all there is, the cluster. And that means you're also going to be deleting any data you have. So that becomes a bit of an issue. But there's a feature. You can join the Spark cluster that you're creating. You can point it to a storage account you already have in Azure and then tell it to use that. And by doing that, when you upload files and things like that, you won't lose it when you delete the cluster. Now, it actually also will let you, when you're creating your Spark cluster, have it create a storage account. But then, if you want to just delete everything by deleting the resource group, you'll also you lose your data. So it's really easier to create a storage account in Azure first and have a, create a container where you want to put your data that you're going to be using and then work off of that. Or if you already have data that you want to be using with Spark, you can just point specifically to that storage account and container. So this way, when you delete the cluster, you still have the data. All right, so let's jump in. Okay, so the first thing I want to show you is I already I already have a storage account, AW storage account EDA. And if I go down here, I can go into my containers. And in my containers, you can see I have several containers here. Now, for this video, I created this AWE, AWEDA, AdventureWorks Exploratory Data Analysis. I did this earlier, so you can see that when I did, the Spark cluster creation put a bunch of files on the cluster for me, on the storage for me, and I have it all sitting here. A bunch of other files as well. And I've been playing around, practicing uploading files, so you can see I have files here also that I've uploaded. So that's all good. But I just wanted to show you, I have a pre-existing storage account that I was able to link to HD Insight. Now, if we go back home for a minute, I already have my cluster, but I wanted to show you where you would make this change as you create it. So if I go to an HD Insight, I'm gonna create an HD Insight cluster and say create. I wanna click over to storage and you can see on storage, Azure storage, right, right here select from a list so i'm just going to select it from the list and you can see that i have aw storage account let me bring that up a little bigger so aw storage account and then here i can enter the name of AWEDA of the container it doesn't give you a drop down of the containers i'm not really sure why but you can just type it in so i'm using just regular azure storage blob storage i'm not getting into any of the other fancy stuff like data lake storage etc but that's the basic gist of what you need to do. And then I would say review and create. And lo and behold, it will be pointing to that. And now when I upload my files, etc., it's going to a permanent storage on my storage accounts and I'm good to go. So let's go. I'm going to go into my Spark cluster here. I need to go into my Zeppelin notebook. I've already got it running, but I would click here, enter my login, and I'm good to go there. I'm going to pop right over to my Zeppelin notebook, which is already there, so I can step through it with you. But this is really the code you've already seen before when we were on Databricks with only slight changes. One of the things I, I added actually in most cases is if not exists everywhere, because that way, if an object already exists, I don't get an error. So first thing I wanna do is create a, a database called AW Project, and I'm gonna run this cell. 
And the if not exists just says, well, if that database already exists, don't give me an error. So that's now there. And I can set the default database I want to be in by using the use statement. So I'm going to say use AW project. And you can think of databases on Spark more like folders because it's not a true database management system. Now I'm going to do a create table. So I want to create a table, say if not exists, so that it won't give me an error. If the table's already there, I can rerun the notebook. I'm going to create a date dimension, dim date. And I'm going to be doing that from a CSV file. And I'm going to say options and path. And I have to say forward slash dim date CSV. Header equal true and in first schema, schema equal true. Now I'm going to back up for a minute because I'm going to run this so you can see it. And there it is. Good to go. But let me step back for a minute because I didn't show you how I put the data up there. So there is data that will be in the zip file in the GitHub. I'll give you the link. So you want to go to your storage account, go to your containers, find the container where you want to put your files for HD Insight. In this case, it's AW EDE. And then I can just click on this button up here, Upload. And from here, it says select a file. And I just click in here or click on the, the folder there. And I can pick what I want. So I can say, I want to upload dim date. I want to upload uh, department group, etc. And I won't have all these files. You don't need all of these for this. But I'm going to upload the files. I'll just give the ones you need. Say open. And this one's telling me these files are already there. So you shouldn't get that error. Um, let me try one thing here. I know dim currency is not there. So dim currency is not one there. I'm going to upload that by saying upload and you'll get a message just like that. So that'll bring it up and now you'll be good to go. You can use it. So that's all I did here and you can see dim date, dim geography, dim product. They were all already uploaded. So you can just do that and you can select multiple files to make that easier. Once they're there, this container, because we bound our cluster to it, is the default location when we're in our notebook. So we don't have to do anything special for that. Okay, so when I ran this, that's where it was looking and dim date was already there. Again, a key thing, you must put the forward slash before the file name or it will not find it. All right, took me a while to figure that out because I was getting errors and I had it very differently written. I was using the Databricks file system on Databricks. So those are the little nuances you can kind of find yourself in. And I think I ran this already, but I'll run that. That's just gonna select from my dim date table and now it's part of my SQL environment. So it's pretty cool. And just notice that I am using percent SQL as my magic to tell it what kernel to be running. One thing you cannot do when you're using Zeppelin notebooks with HD Insight is you cannot run more than one SQL statement in one block, in one cell. And typically when you try to do that in, say, Databricks, you put a semicolon after it. Zeppelin notebooks does not accept semicolons at all. So here, if I want to get rid of this table I created, I can do it separately. I can say if exists, but if I really want to get rid of it and recreate it, I'll need to use two cells. This one's going to drop the table, dim sales reason. And then the next one I can recreate it. So I'm creating dim sales reason here. Now I want to point out in this case, I've before I've been doing in first schema, but here I'm going to let it, I'm going to actually tell it what I want to call the column names and what the types are. So that's the biggest difference here. I'm going to run that. And that will actually use the schema I told it because I overwrote it by putting the definition of the columns here. Okay, here I'm going to say I want to create dim sales reason using CSV. Again, just pointing to my file. Let's run that. And I'm just really going to go through and create a bunch of tables here. I can take a look at this afterwards to say, did it work? Should only give me one row back and there it is, great. And here I'm gonna be doing dim customer. Again, remember that forward slash. And this is going to be pulling in my customer table. So these CSV files have the column names at the top. It's comma separated. And again, I'm using the header to define the column names and the schema is being inferred. There's a lot of ways you can do this. I'm taking the easiest way to do it, so I'm letting Spark do as much of the work as possible. So here I'm bringing in Jim Geography. I'm creating a table, Jim Geography. And it's really the same thing over and over. So I'm just going to keep doing this. And in product, 
product category. And these are all the different dimensions we're going to need later, the dimension tables, product subcategory. So product is actually snowflaked. We've got three different dimension tables we need to join to make them meaningful. And we'll take a look at that later. We have dim sales reason. Make sure I get that. And dim sales territory. And we can always add more if we need them later. We want to add more tables into this. And the big one, the fact table, is fact internet sales. You can see it here. And again, we're bringing it in. And we're just going to load that as well. And I'll give you a quick look at it just to show you what that looks like. Running this right here. You can see Fact Internet Sales has quite a few different columns. So here we're going to be saying we want to build the table Fact Internet Sales Reason. And again, we're going to be defining the schema. And last time I did this, I didn't say enforce schema false, but I did this time. But that's probably what you should say because we're actually telling it the schema. And uh, we're just going to run this. One thing I wanted to show you is a couple of things you can do. You can do this in Databricks, but this is Spark commands describe table. So I can do describe table. And this extended will give me all of the information that we saw earlier. So we'll get properties, etc. So I can scr uh, scroll here and just get all this information about that table, column names, etc. and properties. If I want to see a list of the tables in the database, I can do show tables, as you see here. And you'll get all the different tables there. You can see I had this playing around there. I got a dim date three. So you can so up there. And uh, this one is a dim date two I created. I won't bother doing that. I'll use dim date. But I was just doing a lot of playing around. So you can see to select dim date. So wrapping up, we talked about the adventure works use case. And basically it's like understand our data better, understand our sales data, our customer data, do some exploratory data analysis give management some nice visuals and graphics. That'll keep them happy for a while. And eventually, we want to build a machine learning model that will predict what a given prospective customer is likely to buy. We looked at understanding the data. And I talked about the data science process and the steps we're going to go through. Uh, but just understanding how the data works, et cetera. And I talked about an Apache Spark issue in particular. Now, it's not really an issue, per se, but the Spark cluster itself in Spark, if you remember my other videos, in Spark, you pull data up into memory, basically. So all the data is really loaded in memory. Unlike a relational database, which you're typically going back to storage and pulling data out, everything gets loaded onto the nodes in memory. And so it doesn't really need a lot of storage behind it. But it has to have a place to get the data. So we're uploading files. You're going to be using data from probably everywhere. You can pull it from SQL. You can pull it from, you know, you might pull it from like Azure SQL database or Postgres SQL or blob storage as we did. So there's a lot of places you're going to want to do that. So typically you've got your Apache Spark cluster, but you need to get data from other places. And that's what we wanted to get here. Now, the problem we had is if we just let it go with its default approach, we wouldn't really have a permanent place to store our data and we keep losing it and have to keep loading it, uploading it again. So by pointing it to an existing Azure storage account, we can just get around that problem and we can delete the cluster and not lose everything we have. And finally, we walked through a riveting demo where I walked you through creating SQL tables on Apache Spark. We use the Zeppelin notebooks, which I really like as far as notebooks go. So I hope you do too. But I think they mirror Databricks notebooks pretty well. I think Databricks lifted <laughs> the Zeppelin notebooks to a large extent and used that as their notebook because it does have nice visualization features and things like that. It's a richer kind of interface than typical Jupyter. So that's it. I hope you like this. Please like, subscribe, share, let people know about my channel. Hope you liked it and everything. And since I'm still going with the Star Trek theme, live long and prosper. Until next time, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together. Thank you.